Arab-American choreographer Sonia Taya is a go-getter in every sense of the word. Her relentless drive, sheer resolve, and extraordinary talent has earned Sonia a Tony Award and two Emmy nominations. Despite these honors and her megastar status, she never loses sight of her work's integrity and the importance of a captivated audience. I always think in my mind, regardless of the applause or response, when I'm looking at it, am I proud of it? When I'm looking at them, are they lost? Are they immersed? That's the ticket for me. You're listening to Moving Moments, the podcast that explores the dance world's most accomplished and groundbreaking artists. I'm your host, Alicia Graf Mack, Dean and Director of Dance at the Juilliard School. During each episode, you'll hear me talk with some of my closest friends and most trusted colleagues as we sit down to hear about their creative process and how they are changing the dance world on and off the stage. I became familiar with your work, like so many of your fans, as a regular viewer of So You Think You Can Dance. Mm -hmm. And I watched your choreography grow and evolve over several seasons, and I always was so intrigued by your aesthetic and your point of view. I felt like it was different than most things that I had seen on television. And I knew that you were developing your career as a commercial dance choreographer and a musical theater artist. And then I saw more and more of your work coming into the concert dance world. Can you have predicted this trajectory of your life and the fullness of your career? Wow, you're hitting it from the top, right? I, yeah, I feel like, <laughs> why not? Let's just start big and then we'll go granular. <laughs> no, when I think about what, my life, my upbringing was like, this is not the story that I thought would be my story. But my family just instilled so much drive. So I just had this and still have this relentless <laughs> drive and desire that just keeps me going. I just always wanted to be in a room with people who are inspiring. And I wanted to be inside of projects that are challenging and that nurture and celebrate dance. But it's a blessing to have a, a versatile career and be able to jump into different rooms. There's nothing like it, nothing. It but it was hard to demand to not choose one lane. It was mm. a big battle. I hope to talk about that as we get into yeah. our conversation because I feel like so many artists from a young age feel that they have to choose. Do you remember we bumped into each other at New York City Center in 2019 for Fall for Dance, which is one of the biggest concert dance celebrations in our country. Mm -hmm. You were choreographing uh, for a few dancers from American Ballet Theater, and I think Robbie Fairchild, is that right? Yep. With Moses as yeah. the recording artist and performing live. I think we both fangirled <laughs> on each other <laughs> in the hallway. I was like, oh my gosh. That's her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't know the story before that. You don't know that I was like pacing around the stairs trying to get courage to talk to you. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. You're so sweet. And you gave me your contact information immediately. And all I could think was, I would win so many cool points with my students if I could get <laughs> Sonia to Juilliard. <laughs> and I did. And it, uh, your participation was amazing and your artistry and the way you worked with students and young people. And I think that all comes down to the seeds of who you are. So I want to start with your upbringing and what brought you to dance in the first place. Wow, you just really got the good question. Can you talk about your early beginnings and your first memories of dancing, your first memories in movement. Yes. I come from Detroit, which is the mecca of house music and techno music and so much art thriving in that city. I don't remember when I was a little, little Sonia, but my mother always talked about when I was born, I was always moving around and like you couldn't, I couldn't sit still, but I was also incredibly shy, but every time music came on or bedtime was happening. It was like, mom, come downstairs. I want to make this performance for you. Or like, I was always choreographing something, but it was always choreography. It was making the stuff. Hmm. It was always directing <laughs> the stuff, <laughs> like curating the house. Yes. You know? <laughs> Setting the stage. Setting the stage for 
a performance of some kind. But again, I was really shy. So I, I don't think my mother thought it was gonna be something that I would hold on to. And then I went to this woman's house in her basement. She taught tap, ballet, and jazz for $5. And she was amazing. I went there for a couple years and then picked it back up in my, I think I was 17, at a studio. But before then, my mother would find dance books at garage sales about Twyla, about Martha. So I was mm -hmm. very much like, what was in my hand first was of these incredible women. Wow. That's what I think started the whole relentless energy <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> is talking about them and seeing pictures of them, seeing Martha with her hair down and dark lipstick and barefoot and all these really twisty concave postures and seeing Twyla with her leg warmers and sneakers soaring yeah. and, the, and having those pictures where she's just so high in the air, you know? That was the stuff that really stuck in my mind. We just didn't have the money to have it be so consistent mm -hmm. um, as a kid. So I was in, in theater and school and all the free extracurricular activities. And then when I was in high school, I really wanted to get into some dance classes. I could feel something whispering, but no one, none, none of those local schools would let me because they would say, we've had these kids for, since they were three, what are we gonna right. do with you, mm -hmm. you know? Which I think is a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because dancing can happen at any, any point. And also dreams can mm -hmm. happen at any point. That's what I think puts too much pressure on kids, but let me not, not rear. And then I found a studio and I begged them to let me take classes with the young kids. I was like, I know I'm of the age. I don't know what age that is <laughs> in my mind, but I'll be behind, but I don't care. I really want to learn. I really want to do this. And it wasn't the clearest guidance, but it got me to a place to know that this is something that I wanted to do. And then inside of that, I was really immersed, like I told you, in the underground dance scene, the, mm -hmm. the house music and techno music, underground raves, which was, I think, the place where it all made sense and the place where I learned from so many artists, the freeing place. Yeah. I didn't have the, I didn't have the foundation, which I really am happy about because it gave, it just gave me a sense of courage and freedom to just try things. Yep. But that was the root of how I knew I wanted to be a choreographer because I would stand on the top of the speakers and see the sea of people. And, and I remember thinking in my mind, how do I make that? Wow. I want to I wanna, I wanna make what that feels like. I don't want to be what that feels like. I want to uh -huh. make what that feels like. Amazing. I mean, I, it was definitely wasn't the easiest road. But then I met um, um, amazing professors. That's what's shifted the game. Mm. The, these women, and they were all women. Everyone, all of my teachers. And it just at that time just instilled a different drive. They were all teaching their own techniques in college. And I just said, I don't, I don't know how to do this, but I know I want this really bad. And will you help me? And they did. Oh, wow. Yeah. It sounds like these incredible women, including your mother, were so influential <laughs> in your development, but also in your character. Can you talk a little bit about your upbringing, what your mother may have instilled in you. I've read that you have sisters. What influences did they have on you? Oh my goodness, so much. I have two glorious, perfect, amazing sisters <laughs> that I'm so close with that are incredible and a badass mom. <laughs> it was just about freedom and regimen and honoring a rawness, like honoring, I come from an Arab, beautiful Arab family. And while she's like rolling grape leaves and making bread, <laughs> <laughs> it was always just try it. Who knows? The curiosity was very much a part of my life. Of course we have our stuff, but in the root of it all, it was really about do what you love but do it with honor and do the work. She would say, whatever you do, do it right. And I took it as 
do the work, find the glory inside of it, mm -hmm. find the truth inside of it, but find your truth inside of it. It was like really smart questions as a kid. <laughs> Does it feel right? Listen to your body, listen to your mind. Don't worry about what people think. It was always that type of lean into your truth conversations, really young. Mm. Do you remember attending your first performance or can you recall a performance that you saw early on that rocked your world? Oh my goodness, yes. There's two. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> One was when there's that old interview with Martha Graham mm. it's on YouTube. It's mm -hmm. been on forever. She's talking about her dancers and they're dancing behind her and she's talking about art. And when I was in college, I was in my dance history class and they played that for the first time. And I just remember weeping, just weeping. Oh. These moments were always these really big, big feelings. I was overcome by, wow, you can love something that big. You can go from four dancers and like six people in your audience. Oh, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It was that. You know what I mean? Right. It was really about the quest and this hot, hot, hot pursuit. And it just, that's what I think I was hearing when, I, when she would talk about dance is what, that it was a cellular need. I don't think for me it was, it's a choice. I think it's my calling, whether you like me or not. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's very much of like, no matter what, I'm going to, there's this God, like, or God, whatever, whatever you believe in, mm -hmm. thing that happens when I, when I watch or hear something inspiring. And that moment really rocked me. Mm. It really, really got me bad. I was at, was it right after that? <laughs> I was just like, is this woman real? Is this real? It was that. And then it was just recently, actually, when Pina's documentary came out. Pina Bausch. Yeah. 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 I think it was because of how they spoke about her, what you saw on their face when they spoke about her, when her mm -hmm. company spoke about her. It made me hope that that's what we can leave. That's the effect you can have on people that you create with. Well, let's let's go back to y your time in school and graduating and now coming into your career. Well, when I was 26, I graduated college and then I moved to San Francisco for three years. My friend had a small dance company and I basically locked myself in that studio mm. and said, you need more time. So I went there and I, it, I, it was such a blessing because I got to create on these incredible young artists and just kept building material and taking my time and really trying to understand what I wanted to do. And then So You Think You Can Dance was in its first season when I still lived in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was such a big moment for Dan to begin a really vast conversation about it. And I was just curious about it. And I said one day, I don't know why I said it. I said, I'm going to be on that one mm. day to my best friend. He was like, I have no doubt. And then he closed his company. I decided to move to L.A. because I thought that I kept hearing, because I, I wasn't in it, inside of it yet, right? But I kept hearing how you have to choose. Are you concert dance? Are you commercial dance? And I mm -hmm. always thought, what, do you, what does that mean? Concert and commercial dance, what does mm -hmm. this mean? And at that time, music videos were thriving and dance was getting around. Yeah. And I saw this fusion there. So I moved to L.A. And as you said, it, you, you need an agent. So I sat there for eight months at first. <laughs> and I taught a couple of classes with three people in it. And and then, oh, Carnival, that mm -hmm. it was a, it's a huge choreography show. Mm -hmm. And if you get asked, it's a, it was a big deal to get asked. I knew that was coming up and I knew I needed to do something. So I decided to have a show. I decided to call some friends to live at my place and sleep in my living room for two months. Oh my God. And I rented a theater and I was like, okay, let me do something that looks like a Gap commercial, something that can be a, a Skechers commercial, something for this artist something for this company. And I created like 12 pieces. Oh, and they were all goodness. like six, seven minutes long. And 
it was when you still flyered cars. Mm -hmm. So I made a bunch of flyers and posters and flyered the hell out of LA. Wow. And yeah. And before then, I got asked to do Carnival. I took one of the pieces from my show and the agent that I, I wanted to sign me happened to be there. And he was like, this is very interesting. I'm really intrigued. And I was like, perfect, because I just sent you a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you still have one of those flyers. Oh, yeah. I have all of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. My very first flyer. Uh, and I said, I'm saving a row and I want you to come. And the show was sold out. I don't know what, I don't, I don't know how it happened, but it just, it was a really big success. And he called me the next morning. He said, come to the office. And he said, we want to sign you. And I said, okay, but I have a dream, I have a dream list and I'm going to list it out. I want you to say yes to it, you know? Yeah, was well, like, tell me the list. I want yeah. to know what the dream list was. <laughs> I said, I want to get on So You Think You Can Dance. Mm-hmm. I want a musical. I want to do work like Graham and Bill T. And they said, that's big. Well, that's, that's, real, that's really wide range. And I was like, if you don't believe I can do it, I can't be here. Because I believe I can do it. I'm gonna, but I'm going to need support. And they said, okay. And then, I think it was a month later, Leash, they called about So You Think. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was so crazy <laughs> because the producer happened to be at my show. And then it just and then erupted. Wow. So in these moments, it's a big moment, right? What do you lean on? What is your process? How do you even begin? I get the chills just thinking about <laughs> it still. I have been on that show for 10 years now, but I was terrified and really excited. And the first one... The first piece I did was a piece I thought everyone wanted to see. Mm. It wasn't a piece I did. I see. I leaned into what I thought I should lean into, mm -hmm. and I didn't lean into my insights. Mm. And I felt it when I was there. When you felt that moment, mm -hmm. which sounds like it wasn't as authentic to who you are, how did you begin to find your choreographic voice. I remember sitting there saying, never again, never again. Am I gonna listen to anyone? <laughs> Tell me, be careful, or this is too big, or this is too strange. And you know, I was the strange one on that show, the mm -hmm. weird one, as they say. And that's when your first, when that's your first opportunity, that was hard to hear. I pray a lot, coming from a really religious family, and that being complicated, but finding my way through it, mm -hmm. calling my mom in the bathroom of the studio <laughs> before <laughs> before we have to air and her reminding me to stay true to myself. And this life is once, mm -hmm. you get this one time. So I always think in my mind, regardless of the applause or response, when I'm looking at it, am I proud of it? When I'm looking at them, are they lost? Did they, did they, are they immersed? Mm -hmm. That's the ticket for me. And so I had to get that feeling back. And once I got that feeling back, I was off to the races. In terms of y your process, this podcast is really about those moving moments. The first time you saw Martha Graham yeah. on a documentary that changed how you perceived what art could be. Or the first time that you saw your work on stage and realized, I did it. How did you get to the point to know your process? When it, when it became more heightened and the stakes got higher fast, because once you're on it, it was just like explosion, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone notices you, talks about it. It was like in its third or fourth season, so it was still brand new. I think when, when it gets loud like that, and mm -hmm. you, you are trying to find your way back, it's quieting down. I have to quiet myself down and ground myself and turn down the volume of the world and everyone's perception, assumptions, expectations, all of those things get really wound up, like they really can wrap you up. And I just find it 
still I'm 45 now. And I, I, it's still these moments where I pray and I quiet the mind and I, and I remember I really can smell why mm -hmm. I'm here. I go back to the time where I was at those parties. I go back to the time where I lost two really uh, great friends of mine. And they, they're the ones that taught me how to dance, literally taught me how. Like pushed me going across the floor, teaching me how to do a pas de bourree. Like mm. It was like that. So I go to that. I remember those moments. That's what gets me back to a place where my ego gets put aside, <laughs> where I can really see clearer. And if I can stay on that ride, it's a quieter ride. Mm -hmm. It's a more fruitful ride. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a more satisfying ride because I'm in my own cells inside of a process. I'm really listening to myself and listening to how I want to move. When I first started movement, because of those foundations I didn't have, I was, I, or even, or just my instincts, I just have an aggressive way of moving and a heightened physical way of moving. And it's really overt and it's super passionate. Anytime I deny myself of that, I'm not doing what is coming out of me. So I just have to remember that I get this once and it is the one place where I feel like I'm floating. Mm. And I would like to hold on to that feeling. Yeah. In this podcast, I've asked every artist, can you describe the moving moment? Can you describe that magic moment? And what I hear from you is that it's floating. Yes. <laughs> For me, it's when I come to and I say, what time is it? <laughs> and four hours went by. Right. And I look at everyone glistening from sweat and there's this euphoria energy. You know, there's this mm -hmm. euphoria around. It's just feeling the most alive mm. is everything feels glittery. <laughs> <laughs> For me, that's where God is. That's heaven. And it comes back to that idea of what your calling is. Yeah. Right. What what you are meant to do with your life. Yeah. And so with your calling, you have done so many things and you have checked off everything on that list <laughs> that you gave to your to your agents um, several seasons. And I'm sure continuing on. So you think you can dance. You've worked with Madonna. You've worked with Florence and the, the Machine, Kylie Minogue. You've worked with Kung Fu off Broadway, created that choreography and won several awards for that. I know you have, because I saw it, and it was <laughs> awesome, the live TV version of Rent, and of course, Moulin Rouge. What makes you say yes to all of these various projects? When they sound really challenging <laughs> <laughs> and big, hell yes. When I, when I know who's go going to be in the room, these mm. really ambitious artists, these people that want to find something greater and love collaborating, mm -hmm. really believe in the art of collaboration. It's lonely doing it alone. I want to have these challenging conversations and challenge each other and be of that mindset. But there definitely is a whisper. I can, when I get offered something, I, I really feel generated by something. There's something that happens behind me that mm -hmm. says go or stop. And I just let that ride. And I've been in rooms where it doesn't fit, but that's also the beauty of what we do is learning how to manage those. Yeah. You know what I mean? Learning how to hold on to yourself. I haven't done a lot of work in the commercial world, but the work that I have done, I always felt that the choreographer and the dancers seem so secondary when I know how important they are to the success of whatever the work is. And I think that as a choreographer, not only do you have to think about the artistic excellence of the work, but you also have to be a boss in the room, right? Oh, you yeah. have to really be <laughs> able to articulate your voice, to have it heard, and to be able to fight for your artistic beliefs. How did you learn how to manage the room like that? 
Ooh, that's a tough one because it is not easy. I've been in some situations. <laughs> <laughs> situation. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you're so right. I always say this is going to be a chapter in my book one day of why people think dance is easy. Like, this is the part where you dance. Right. And now we dance. It's easy, <laughs> right? Or not using the word ensemble mm -hmm. as if they're tray holders. And I want to say sometimes, or oftentimes, okay, cool, cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the ensemble to step down for a second and come into the house with me. And, th and then I'm gonna say, go. Okay, go. What do you have? Not much left. Not much left. Not much left. Because the body tells so many mm. important stories and it can drive a narrative. It can drive a musical. It can drive a play. Mm -hmm. The way you open the door in a play is movement, yeah. period. Period. You can tell how hot I'm getting. Because <laughs> it really is a, it's an issue. It's a problem. And so I think I needed to get the volume that I'm getting right now. And sometimes that's hard. I knock it down really fast. All conversations need to be treated with that much respect because the dancers need to be treated with that much respect. It's, it's so important. We should have a whole nother mm -hmm. conversation about <laughs> dancers and pay equity in situations yep. where other artists or the types of artists are involved. But that's a conversation for another <laughs> day. <laughs> but we should at least like one day, yeah. let that be our next yeah, conversation. Really. Let's talk about Moulin Rouge and yeah. about how that opportunity came about. How did that door open for you? Moulin Rouge. So Alex Timbers is an amazing director. I've worked with before Moulin Rouge called me to to go to coffee and told me he was in the process of getting Moulin Rouge going. And I was like, oh my God, that, I remember seeing that film um, at one of my favorite old, old theaters in Detroit and running out of there and singing all the songs and sprinting <laughs> down the street and just finally seeing an overt aesthetic that made sense to me. The way Baz directs is just like so pulsating and exciting. So. I auditioned, which isn't my favorite thing <laughs> to do. I had it in my gut, though, that I was, it was mine. Mm. The minute he asked me, I, it really felt like mine. At that time, I was really charged, really focused on leaning into myself, like really grounded, saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this audition. I'm going to do it. This is just the thing. I'm going to call all my, my people, all the dancers that I love. I'm going to pick the two, two sections that I wanted to do, and we're going to do it. And I just felt really steady about it. And then it took so many months to let me know. But then when he called me, I remember I was eating dinner at my house and my phone rang and I just stared at the phone. And then I stood <laughs> up. <laughs> I stood up and I grounded myself and I <clears throat> prayed in Arabic. And then I said, you're losing nothing either way. You're losing nothing either way. Then he said, I got it. And then life changed again. Whew. Okay, so you got the yep. job. Yep. And then things start moving and fast forward, I'm sure. How did you see the whole work unfolding and what was most important to you? I said, this is the moment where there's going to be so much dance. And the yes. ensemble gets to drive a story. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Let's go. Mm -hmm. This is going to shift it. It's going to bring, bring back this conversation wow. about how important an ensemble is mm -hmm. and how dance, again, can drive a story. And you have these eight minute dances with no dialogue, no scenes in between. I mean, it was a dream. It's really one of my greatest gifts of my life. It makes my eyes water still. I have butterflies right now. Just thinking about how hard it was in the best way, just hundreds of hours of pre-production, 45 different versions of Roxanne, truly so many different so many different versions. The opening is almost 13 minutes long. That's the can-can entrance. That's mm -hmm. your first entrance is doing 36 kicks. After the production period and it's opening night and you're sitting there, what is going through your mind? Oh my God, my eyes water. Just thinking about it again. So much pride, really like a circular pride for all of my colleagues. I just was in a state of 
if I were to get a musical, how did I get this one? You know what I mean? <laughs> so much dance and a story about truth, beauty, freedom, and love in a place where you don't have to pick a lane and there's so many genres mm -hmm. of dance in there. That's the world I want to live in. Queer people everywhere, all walks of life everywhere. Everyone is welcome. I'm, I'm qu quoting the qu quotes of the show, <laughs> sorry. But it's true, knowing that that's the world I helped build, I felt really proud. Uh, and when you gave your Tony speech, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, look at Sonia up there, oh my gosh. So well deserved. Thank you. Thank you so much. How did you write that speech? What a moment. Yeah, thank you. I knew that was the time. I knew that was going to be a platform where people were listening. And, and I had a lot to say about the culture. And yeah, I just, I knew that that was the moment. And I was too scared to write it, too nervous to think about it. And then a couple of nights before, it just fell on, the, it really fell fell on the paper. It's crazy how long it took for a woman to win. It's wild, you know, to be an Arab American woman standing up there was also wild. You will be in history books. No. Yes, you will. <laughs> and you think about your time at Wayne State opening a book or watching a documentary and how those people changed your world. You will be that person. You are that person, I should say, yeah. actively now. Like I said, it's been hard. You have to really break down doors and get yourself to a really courageous place to not be pinned. I always say I was for years, just recently still, Sonia Taya from So You Think You Can Dance, like it's my address. So it's it's up to people like us to have these conversations and, and refuse that because look at you and your leadership at Juilliard. One day we're going to turn this around. I'm going to have <laughs> a, a podcast about you and your okay. incredibly <laughs> amazing you're just a legend and you know that. I hope you know that because I'll be here to remind you, but uh. <laughs> what you do for these kids and nurturing what they want and they all want such different things. Mm, yeah. And that's important to give them that space to want and to be curious. Mm. Well, thank you. Let's close out with a full circle moment. Thinking about your inspiration, thinking about one of your idols, Martha Graham, and then being invited to come and create Twice, is that right? Yes. Uh, yep. Twice. What does that mean to you to come back to this idea of the beginnings? It's like there's a cosmic reason why that was the way. Mm -hmm. Because it's like something in my cells projected into the universe when I saw her video <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> and it laid the foundation. I really believe in that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What season are they in? Like 90-something yes. season, right? And the work is still important, valued, effective. And that's a visceral world I want to be a part of. It's a reminder that if you hold that rawness and that truth to yourself, that the work sticks. It's not about being liked. It's about being effective. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And she affected people. She affected me. She changed my life. She got, like, my cells to awaken in a way that I've never experienced before. Bjork too, Twyla too. It's not about the product. It's about their process. Period. End of story. It's what Twyla writes in her book about how she struggles in her process and what care she has to prepare. It's really about the fundamental truth inside of this one life you have. And you could either go that way and hold tight, or you could go and be half alive. And that is the scariest place. So the long way that answer to your question is it reminds me not to be half alive. It's a constant reminder. Wow. Yeah. I think that's a really great place to finish this part of the conversation. <laughs> I am so moved by you and I'm so inspired by you always. And Thank I hope you. our, our audiences feel the same. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was awesome. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Moving Moments. If you like what you heard, please, Tell your friends about it. Spread the word. Be sure to follow the show, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up with future episodes, follow us on Instagram at Moving Moments Podcast and visit us at artfulnarrativesmedia.com. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist's moving moments.